Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Pine Grove campus of Spry Church. We are glad that you're here to worship with us today. Special welcome to any guests we have in the room and everybody watching online as well. Here at Spry Church, our mission is to love Jesus, it's to be transformed, and it's to declare hope and to see our church, our community, and our world experience that ministry. And so we're following after Jesus as we do that together. As we begin our time today, we only have one announcement uh, before we get to the meat of today, which is our VBS celebration, which we're super excited about. But our only announcement is this, that we will be doing an outdoor worship night in just a couple of weeks. So this will be Sunday, August 4th in the evening at 7 p.m. over at the School Street campus in the field next to the youth building. And this is just going to be a night of worship. We're going to come together both uh, campuses and uh, just gather no agenda other than to praise God and to worship together. So we invite you to put that on your calendar. Come on out, bring a camp chair for what we hope will be a beautiful night outside for outdoor worship and just being together as God's people and as a church family. So that's all we've got for announcements, and I'm going to pray and then hand it over to Rachel, who's going to lead us in our VBS celebration. So would you pray with me? Father God, we thank you for inviting us here, and we thank you, Lord, um, that you have empowered us to respond, respond to your love, your goodness, your grace, and your mercy, that we might come to you in worship and in celebration of all that you have done for us and all, that, and all of who you are just by your nature. And so, Lord, uh, be with us in the time ahead by the power of your Holy Spirit, and uh, may he empower us to worship you in spirit and in truth. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand. Rachel, let's kick it off. Morning. Oh. Good morning. Okay. I want all the kids and volunteers for BBS to join me up front. treasure hat and putting on my worship leader hat and we had an amazing week at BBS. We led worship. We praised Jesus. We learned about how Jesus loves messy people and he is the only one who can fix any and all messes. So this morning we're going to bring two of our songs that we did this week to you guys and uh, all I can say is please Praise Jesus with us, because that's what these kids did all week. So get into it, clap your hands, move your body, and lift up these words to the one and only Jesus Christ. Mr. Chris, let's go. Clap those hands.
Through is an old camp song, so if you know it, you better be singing it, because it's a good one. And we have sign language that we were taught by Miss Ruth. Where is she? There you are. Get in the front of the crowd here. Front and center. Front and center. So follow her, and kids, you know it, so let's do it. Here we go. I've got peace like a river. I've got peace like a river. You guys can all go back to your seats now, except for the kiddos who are going to tell us about BBS. And everybody can have a seat. Every day at BBS, we begin with energizing worship on day one. We learn that the world is a mess because of sin. Sin is anything we do, say, or think that goes against God's character or word. We also learn that missions is showing people the love of Jesus through our words and actions so they can know and follow him. Day two. On day two, we learn no matter how messy we are, Jesus loves us. Also, we learn about the Spider's food gantry. Some of us even packed boxes. So on day three, we learn that Jesus wants us to confess our mess and tell God what we did wrong and ask him to forgive us and help us fix this mess. And we should also confess, confess our mess to other people and 
and ask them to forgive us and help us with our mess. We also learned about Filter of Hope, which is an organization that provides water to communities, um, and they also share the good news of the gospel. On day four, we learned that Jesus can address our mess through his grace. We, we also learned that George Mueller and Gladys Alward, famous missionaries who followed Jesus and shared the gospel with so many people. On day five, we learned that Jesus wants us to forgive others just as he forgave us. No matter how big of a mess, Jesus loves messy people. At the mission station, each one of us was prayed for by Pastor Ken, Pastor Luke, or Pastor Austin, as they sent us out to share everything we learned about the good news of Jesus. The world, we ended the evening by slamming our pastors and praising Jesus in worship. Let's get a hand for all of our volunteers here. You guys can go ahead and take a seat. Go ahead. Awesome. So the following presentation is just going to give you guys a glimpse into everything that we did at VBS and what an amazing experience it was. Spry Church, we thank you for the wonderful ways you've supported VBS this year. What a mess VBS 2024 has been such a success. God makes beautiful things out of messes. Thank you to all of you who volunteered and served, discipling our kids that came to VBS each night. We had approximately 110 children at VBS. Thank you to those who have supported us through your donations, your financial support for missions, and a special thank you to all of you who have lifted us up in prayer all week. The Holy Spirit is present. He is working and he loves to see his children, all of his children, no matter what age, learning and growing closer to him.
<laughs> so as you can tell, we had a lot of fun at VBS this past week. Um, I'm still picking bits of slime out of my hair. And uh, one thing I just want to call to your attention in that, as you saw our pastors get slimed, um, was I just want you to notice who was doing the sliming. Um, so the first bucket on Pastor Austin came from Becca, his wife. Um, I was slimed. The first bucket came from my dear sister, Denise. And then Ken, you may have noticed his daughter, Annie, being there, the first one to slime Ken. So there was some like personal vendetta in the sliming that I saw. But I always love VBS. It's, it's one of my favorite weeks of the year. Um, and that's primarily because here at Spry, uh, we make a really intentional effort to do the right things with our kids, um, to train them in how to follow and worship Jesus. And so you see there, we have a lot of fun, but every night we teach them to worship, right? And we sing and we praise God together. We try to ground them in these foundational truths of the scriptures. All week we talked about Romans 5, 8, and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And we continue to reinforce that message and the good news of Jesus every single day. Um, we teach them to be on mission and to help them raise funds for different mission projects and teach them that part of their discipleship is reaching out to the world around them and being generous. And then one of my favorite parts of the week uh, every year is that on the very last night, we pray for our kids. And when I say that, I don't mean we just like pray generally and have our team pray. Every single kid stands in front of one of our pastors, and along with the volunteers from their group that they've journeyed with all week, we lay hands on every individual child, and we pray for them, for God's best for them in their life, and for them to be good ambassadors of the good news and the gospel of Jesus, which is just such a significant moment, and I love that we take the time to do that. Um, and so this week was really, really amazing and wonderful, and I have a few thank yous to give. Um, thank you to everybody who volunteered. There are a number of volunteers in the room today. Thank you so much for your investment. I want to say thank you to the worship team. A couple years ago, we switched from doing all worship on the videos um, in VBS curriculum to actually having a live worship team in the building, and the, the difference is amazing. It is, it is such a different level of energy and commitment and excitement. Um, and so thank you, worship team. Specifically, I want to thank Rachel. Uh, so Rachel, I said the last service, I believe that Rachel should have her own kids show on PBS. Um, because she is so good at that leadership role. I want to say thank you to Rose, uh, who helped lead through the week, and you saw her up on stage as part of the worship team. Rose, you do a tremendous job every week, and we're grateful. And then the last person who I don't think is in the room is Emily. Um, Emily has done such a beautiful job these last few years of organizing and leading our VBS. So thank you to all of you, and thank you to them. Let's just say thanks um, for their investment. <clears throat> the last thing to say is this. Um, so we challenged our kids this week, as you saw, uh, to raise funds for two missions projects. One was for our food pantry, and we challenged them to raise 500 uh, goods, non-perishable items for the food pantry, which they exceeded. And then you saw there, um, we are also raising money for Filter of Hope. And Filter of Hope gives clean water and access to the gospel uh, to people around the world. And uh, they were challenged to raise enough money for 20. They raised enough money for more than 40, so they doubled that. But the other cool thing is, is that the job actually of fundraising for that cause continues today. So um, today, out of our regular offering, we will be giving $1 for everybody in attendance at both campuses uh, towards Filter of Hope to continue to buy more water filters. The other thing, though, is that any designated giving that is given today will also go towards Filter of Hope. So if you want to give and you've got a, a check or you've got some cash on you or you want to write an IOU, um, what you do is you just take the envelope that is in front of you in the, the pew and you just write filter of hope on the front. You can write your name if you'd like to get credit for the giving as well for tax purposes and just put your money, put your check in there, seal it up and put it in the offering on your way out. Um, this is our response to what God has done in the lives of our kids this week and it is our joy and our privilege to come alongside of them. But the good news is, we've got more, um, is that this week, uh, a member of our church stepped up and they said, I want to match whatever we raise for Filter of Hope, which means that for every dollar you give, it gets doubled. So if you give a dollar, it's like two. If you give 10, it's like 20, right? And so this is an encouragement for all of you um, to know that your impact this week is going to mean even more um, than just the dollar amount you give because it will be doubled through the generosity of, of that one family. So I just want to encourage you in the rest of our time of worship, think about that, pray about that, and then give as the Lord leads and how he would have you respond. 
But I uh, just want to say thank you once again for um, your wonderful investment in our kids this week. And it matters and it will bear fruit in the long run in the lives of our children. So with that said, uh, I want to invite our scripture reader, Peggy, to the front. Kids, you are dismissed to go downstairs with Miss Rose and uh, continue the week of fun. Come on up, Peggy. Good morning. And now we go from the high to reading Deuteronomy. Our scripture for, le- for today is found in the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 8, 1 through 10. Be careful to follow every command I am giving you today so that you may live and increase and may enter and possess the land the Lord promised on oath to your ancestors. Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years to humble and test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. He humbled you, causing you to hunger and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your ancestors had known, to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Your clothes did not wear out, and your feet did not swell during these 40 years. Know then in your heart that as man disciplines his son, so the Lord your God disciplines you. Observe the commands of the Lord your God, walking in obedience to him and revering him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land a land with brooks, streams, and deep springs gushing out into the valleys and hills, a land with wheat and barley, figs and vines and fig trees, pomegranates, olive oil, and honey, a land where bread will not be scarce and you will lack nothing, a land where the rocks are iron and you can dig copper out of the hills. When you have eaten and are satisfied, Praise the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. The word of God for the people of God. All right. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you and give you praise um, just for your wonderful work among us this week. We thank you for all the ways that you uh, touched the lives of our kids and brought them face to face with life-changing truth. And we pray, Lord, that you would continue to just water and nourish and help those seeds grow in the days and weeks and years ahead. And Lord, as we turn our time and our attention now towards your word, we pray that you would speak to us once again and that you would, by the power of your Holy Spirit, um, nurture our faith as well, those left here in this room. And so God, help us uh, to hear your voice above all others and help us to be more faithful followers of Jesus because of our time here. We pray all these things in his name. Amen. All right, so um, as we jump back into our God Delivers series, I want to start this morning um, just by painting a little bit of a picture for all of you. And uh, this picture is of what I consider to be probably like the sketchiest place, um, the strangest place that I've ever stayed overnight. Uh, And it came for me um, about seven years ago when I was traveling with the organization that I used to work for. And uh, we were in the country of Haiti. Now, I don't know how many of you have ever been to Haiti. I'm sure um, somebody in the room probably has. Um, But sadly today, things in Haiti are pretty rough, and it's actually really difficult to even get into the country as as an American. Um, But back then, um, a lot of mission teams were going in and out, ours included. And at that point, if you were looking for a place to stay in Haiti, you were really looking for two things. Um, Number one was you were looking for a roof over your head. And number two, you were looking for good security, right? Those were kind of the two main priorities. And most of the time, Um, that would be kind of where the creature comforts would end. There really wouldn't be a whole lot more that you were looking for than just those two. And so while we were there, we were kind of traveling around the interior of the country in a few different places. And the primary place that we stayed um, checked both of those boxes. So we had a roof over our head, which was great. And in terms of security, um, there was a guy with a shotgun that stood by the gate to the hotel 24 hours a day. And we were like, that works for us. That seems like good security. Now, to give you a little bit of a visual of what uh, our accommodations looked like, I'll show you a picture. This is a picture of my room. Um, And you'll notice the light is green. 
Um, the reason for that, at least we were told, is that mosquitoes aren't nearly as attracted to green light as they are other kinds of light on the spectrum. And so um, that is not a filter on the picture. That is actually what it was like. And so you can imagine, you know, anytime I was in the room for about four or five days straight in this like kind of dim green light, it also made it really difficult to see dirt which was probably a good thing, <laughs> given all that we knew. Um, there was no air conditioning, as you can imagine, which was no big deal because we were there in February, and it's only 90 um, in Haiti in February. There was a ceiling fan, um, but the ceiling fan rattled around so much that I thought it was going to fall on me and crush me in the middle of the night. Um, so I didn't have a whole lot of confidence in that either. And then, of course, there was the bathroom. So this is a picture of the bathroom. You can see pretty dimly lit. That's as much light as we could get. Um, and uh, the, there were all, always all kinds of bugs and things that kind of made their homes in the corners. And the, the thing that I don't have a picture of that it was most interesting was the shower. So in the shower, it was just a single PVC pipe that just came out of the wall. And the way they got water was that it wasn't running water, it was all gravity fed from the roof. So on the roof there was a big basin where they would catch rainwater, and then um, you would just turn a knob and out would come the water from the PVC pipe. But the thing was, is, and we actually went up on the roof of the hotel to see this, but uh, the thing was is there was only one pipe going from the basin all the way down the stretch of the roof down into all the rooms. Which meant that if you were taking a shower on the end, and somebody upstream from you was showering at the same time, right? You were luckily, lucky to get a trickle of water. And of course, it wasn't heated, right? So whatever the temperature of the rainwater was, that was what you were getting out of the basin as well. So this was an interesting place, right? This was my room for the week. And I promise you, I'm not showing you these pictures to be like, oh, Pastor Luke suffered for Jesus. Like that wasn't, the, that's not the point. Um, but because you know, if you've ever been on a trip like this, and some of you certainly have, um, is you just do what you got to do, right? Like you're in another place, you're in a foreign country, um, you are there hopefully to serve the Lord and you're just like, okay, we're going to grin and bear it and we're going to do it. And so, you know, we showered in this water that wasn't clean, like you couldn't drink it or brush your teeth with it because you could get sick off of it. Um, and then of course you would take these cold showers with all kinds of new six and eight legged friends that decided to shower with you. Um, you're like, oh, hello there, Mr. Spider. I'm going to go this way a little bit, right? But that's just the way that it was. And I know some of us have been on trips that look like that before. Some of us maybe even grew up in homes and lived like that, right? Or in places that make that look nice as well. So I don't want to, um, you know, deny that fact either. But if you've ever experienced that and you've ever done that, then you also know, you also know the pure joy of what I'm going to describe next, which is the beauty and the joy and the excitement of coming back home to your own bed and your own shower and your own food and your own home, right? There is nothing quite like that experience. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I remember coming back from that trip about seven years ago um, to my one bedroom apartment in Mountainville where I was living at the time and it might as well have been the Ritz Carlton. Like, uh, it was eight foot ceilings, but I swear they were 30 that day. Um, you know, the shower was clean, the water was hot, there was high pressure. I had my dial soap and my head and shoulders, right? It felt like I was bathing in the fountain of youth. It was wonderful. I remember going around my apartment and I was like Buddy the Elf in, uh, in Elf. Remember when he's going around New York City and he's just finding such joy in everything? Um, that was how I felt. I was like, the light bulbs aren't green and I can drink the water and this is amazing, right? And then, of course, the next day I ended up in the hospital with a bacterial infection that I got while I was on the trip. <laughs> That's a different story. But here's my question. Um, for those of us that have ever had that experience, my question for you is, when we come back home and we have that great sense of joy and appreciation and gratitude for what we have, how long does that feeling last? How long do we really hold on to that sense of gratitude? As I've, I would bet for most of us, it's probably maybe a week, maybe a couple of days, maybe even just a couple of hours, right? It doesn't tend to last very long. And, and that takes us by surprise because when we do come back and we're experiencing those things again for the first time, maybe in a week or a month, and we're like, oh, this is so amazing. We think that that gratitude is going to last forever. We're like, I will never take this for granted ever, ever again. This is amazing. And yet when we do come back into it and it becomes part of our regular routine again and we enjoy what we own and we enjoy our creature comforts, we very, very quickly just get used to them right? and we stop kind of having that sense of gratitude and appreciation. 
And that's, nothing, that's to say nothing about just kind of appreciating the basic form of what we have. I mean, there are people uh, um, in this room, right? We have not just tubs, but whirlpool tubs, <laughs> you know? And we've got food in the fridge where we walk over and we open it up and it's fully stocked and we say, ah, there's nothing to eat and we get takeout, right? So not only do we have the basics of what we need, but most of us have the opportunity to kind of go above and beyond that. And yet we don't realize how blessed we are, and we don't necessarily come back to give God the gratitude we should. And so ironically, and I found this in my life, maybe you have in yours as well, ironically, it seems like the more prosperous we become, the less likely we are to appreciate it. The more we have and the more we accumulate, the less likely we are to truly thank God and demonstrate our gratitude for all that we have. I would say this is true, right? That there is often, often an inverse relationship between our prosperity and our gratitude. That the more we prosper, oftentimes the less we say thank you. And the thing is, is that this, this habit or this truth that I think a lot of us have experienced is it often leads us down the road towards other more serious kinds of habits or sins. That if we neglect this and we become ungrateful, then oftentimes we are led towards entitlement, we are often led towards self-sufficiency or pride or even idolatry at the end of the day. And so this is surprising to us because we wouldn't think that it would work this way. In our minds, we think the more I have, the more grateful I would become, right? Like if I had more money, if I won the lottery tomorrow, I would be the most grateful person in the entire world. But usually what we see and what we've experienced, it, what we've experienced is that it doesn't really work that way. And what we find is that this can actually be very true, that the blessing of prosperity can very quickly become a curse if we're not careful. That the blessing of getting what we want or getting what we've always wanted or just storing up more and more can lead us down roads where we are actually drifting from our faith, drifting from God, and drifting from those basic practices of saying thank you to the Lord for what he gives us. And so last week, um, we were in the book of Numbers, if you remember that, if you were here, you watched online, and if you remember about last week, the thing that happens for Israel in the book of Numbers is that most of their challenges come from the fact that they're in the wilderness. So most of the things that they face and the hurdles they have to overcome come from that environment. It's dry, it's arid, um, there's no food, no water. And so when they grumble and complain and they turn against Aaron and Moses, as we saw last week, most of those issues come from that environment. The fact that they don't have water, they don't have food, they don't have shelter. And so that gets them kind of mad, kind of hangry at times, and they turn against Moses and Aaron. But today we're jumping over to the book of Deuteronomy, which is the very next book in the Old Testament. And the th- interesting thing about Deuteronomy, um, and don't miss this, this part because it's important, the interesting thing about Deuteronomy is that the primary challenge that Israel faces is actually due to the opposite environment. Instead of being in a place of scarcity, or instead of being in a place where they lack all that they need, what this section of Deuteronomy is all about is about warning them about prosperity that they're actually going to be in a place where they have all of their needs provided for, and yet inherent in that environment are the, just as many, if not more, challenges than being in a place of scarcity. So in the book of Deuteronomy, um, Moses is standing at the edge of the promised land with this new generation of Jewish people. And you remember the original generation died out in their wilderness wanderings because they wandered around for 40 years. And as they stand on the edge of the promised land, Moses essentially gives a sermon. And he kind of downloads a bunch of information to them before they go into the land. Uh, And this is actually Moses' last sermon. So he dies uh, shortly thereafter. And so he's trying to do all he can to prepare the people for this new reality in the promised land. And what's interesting, like we said, is that he warns them of this exact thing, that that their new reality is going to be so different from the wilderness. It's not going to look anything like what they went through before, but they're going to face the opposite problem, that the blessing they experience in the land, if they're not careful, will very quickly become a curse 
for them. And so he says, be careful, be on your guard against this list of things that we're going to talk about in just a second. And so he, he paints a very vivid picture of what can happen in times of abundance. And so um, we're going to look at Deuteronomy 8. So if you have your Bible um, or you want to turn your Bible on, um, you may open to Deuteronomy 8. And we're just going to settle down there and uh, stay there for most of the rest of our time. So like I said, in Deuteronomy 8, um, Moses is giving a sermon to this group of Israelite people, preparing them to get into the promised land. And the first thing that he does in this section is he takes a little bit of time to recount the journey that they have been on. So we're starting in verse 2, if you're reading along with me. He says, Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years to humble and test you in order to know what was in your hearts, whether or not you would keep his commands. And then he goes on to talk specifically about how God provided for the people of Israel while they were in this wilderness test. And he says, he humbled you, causing you to hunger and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your ancestors had known, to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. And then we learned something new, right? So we knew about manna and we knew about water in the wilderness before that God miraculously provided both of those things when there were none. But this, this, is, this was new information um, where we learned that their clothing did not wear out, their sandals didn't wear out, and their feet did not swell during these times. So I don't know if anybody's ever been on like a long hike You know, you go miles and miles and miles, like up the Appalachian Trail or something, and at the end of the day, your feet are just aching, and you're like, my dogs are barking. You know, you take your shoes off, and you put them up, and you put your feet up, and it's the most amazing thing in the world. But what we learned here is that God actually preserves the feet of the people of Israel as they're on this wilderness journey. Uh, The tread on their shoes doesn't wear out, right? Their clothing doesn't wear out as it should over 40 years in the wilderness. And so we see these different ways that God actually provided for them on their journey. But what we also see in this passage is the reason why God took them on this quest. The whole reason why he, he had them spend 40 years in the wilderness, and it's right in the center of the passage, and he says that this happened to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. In other words, what Moses is saying here is that the point of the wilderness was pedagogical in nature. It was, it was educational in nature. Right? It was meant to teach the people of Israel something. It wasn't just pure punishment that they had made God mad and he was like, you're going to wander now, right? You're going to go to time out for 40 years. Instead, he says, I'm going to make you wander so that you learn an important truth about me. Because honestly, the challenges that you are going to face in the promised land are far greater than anything you faced in the wilderness. And before I let you into that land and let you live and dwell there and face those challenges, there are some things that I have to teach you first. And what he sees, what God sees as they get closer and closer to the promised land the first time is that they're not ready yet because they haven't learned to fully trust God, to fully rely on God for his provision. And so he says, I'm not going to let you in yet because you don't trust me enough yet. And when you face those challenges from your enemies in the promised land and they come and they try to take your stuff and you try to set up a kingdom and you try to rule your people, you're going to need me way more than you realize And so before I let you in, you have to learn to trust in my provision for you. And so he brings them to a place where they can't trust. They can't rely on themselves or anything else. They have to rely on him. And so that's why God takes them to the wilderness. And what he says is, is, uh, Moses says, Know then in your heart that just as a man disciplines his son, so the Lord your God disciplined you. And so Moses tells us that this is like a parent-child relationship, right? This is a father disciplining his son to teach them something, to make sure they're prepared for what is next. And the truth is, is that some of us have had this wilderness experience ourselves, right, in our own lives, where, where we have been brought into a place um, where things are sparse, where things are scarce, and God has taught us this same lesson, Because he loves us, right? We've entered into some kind of circumstances where financially things are lean and we just don't have as much as we would like. Or professionally things are lean and we don't have have a job or we're having trouble looking for a job, finding a job. Um, Some of us have been brought into that wilderness land through our health 
we get diagnosed with something and we go all the way to the end of ourselves trying to fix it and we've pulled all the levers that we can and made all the phone calls that we can, taken all the drugs that we can and we just can't fix it. And that brings us to the end of our own efforts and then teaches us to rely more fully on God and his provision. And that's exactly what God has done for the people of Israel here. And so some of us in the room have even experienced that through our own wilderness journey. So that is looking backwards. And Moses kind of reflects upon their time together in the wilderness. But now he says, you're about to enter into a brand new reality. And he says, there's something that is much better ahead of you. And so as you go, you need to observe the commands of the Lord your God and walk in obedience to him and revere him. And here's why. Because the land you are about to enter into is a land of abundance. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land with brooks and streams and deep springs gushing out into the valleys and hills, a land with wheat and barley, vines and fig trees, pomegranates, olive oil and honey. Becky and I were at Trader Joe's yesterday. This sounds like the aisle in Trader Joe's, right? Wheat and barley and vines and figs. A land where bread, and this is important, right? A land where bread will not be scarce. And think about the reality they've been living in for 40 years, right? Bread has been scarce. There's only been manna and that's it. Bread will be scarce and you will lack nothing. And as you read that description, um, it's very Edenic, right? It sounds like the Garden of Eden. And the reason for that and the purpose of that is that, the, is that Moses is painting us a picture of where God wants Israel to be. And what he wants to do is bring them into this promised land and kind of treat them like Adam and Eve, he wants them to live in a land of abundance, which is, was true in the beginning, where Adam and Eve have, had everything they needed. And he wants them to live in that land in closeness and relationship with him, which is exactly what Adam and Eve had, right? That they lived in this place where they had everything and they were walking closely with God. And so God wants Eden back. He said, I'm bringing you this land and I'm bringing you into this place so we can have that kind of relationship together. But we know, right, because of sin, that even though that sounds great and the abundance is awesome, that there are certain traps laid and pitfalls laid on this journey. That as we've already talked about, sometimes prosperity doesn't help us as much as we think. And that's what Moses warns us of next. And he, he, he lays out kind of um, in order these pitfalls that you and I can find ourselves in, that Israel definitely found themselves in. He says, when you have eaten and are satisfied, um, praise the Lord your God for the good land that he has given you. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God, failing to observe his commands, his laws, and his decrees that I am giving you this day. And so here he makes the connection between being eaten, or between being eaten, between eating and being satisfied, right? This picture of prosperity and kind of the first trap that we can fall into that we see here right in the center, which is to forget the Lord. That for some reason, when we find ourselves in times of plenty, the first thing that follows after that is kind of a spiritual amnesia, where we forget that God is the one that has brought us this far, and God has been the one that has been, been providing for us all along. And that because we forget that God is responsible for everything, our devotion to him and his commands becomes very lax. And so we forget about all the ways that God provided, and we come into this place where we have abundance, whether it's material things or abundance of relationships or abundance of opportunities, and yet the more we have, the more we tend to actually forget that God is the source of all of our blessings. Um, James chapter 1 and verse 17 says that exact thing. It says, every good and perfect gift comes from above. God is the source of all blessings, and yet when we prosper, we often forget that. Deuteronomy 6, um, God says, you are going to drink from cisterns that you did not dig. You're going to drink wine from vineyards you did not plant. And you are going to eat olives off of olive trees that you did not cultivate. And when he says that, he says exactly the same thing. And he says, and when that happens, do not forget the Lord your God. In other words, I'm giving you all of this. You didn't plant it, you didn't cultivate it, but you're going to eat from it. And it's all grace. Don't shrug your shoulders and say, well, I, just, I just, guess I just got lucky, right? Like right place at the right time. No, God provided that for you. And don't forget that he is the one that is behind it. 
So that's the first trap, right? The first, the first trap is kind of stumble over ourselves and forget that God is behind everything that we experience as blessing anyway. But that's not the end of the journey. If we forget, there's another trap that's laid for us behind that. And it says, otherwise, so if you forget, otherwise, when you eat and are satisfied, when you build fine houses and settle down, and when your herds and flocks grow large and your silver and gold increase, and all you have is multiplied, then your heart will become proud and you will forget the Lord your God. And so the second kind of trap here is pride, right? Which makes sense. If we forget that God is behind our blessings, we will look around for somebody to give credit to for what we have, won't we? And then we'll look in the mirror and we'll say, oh, that's right, it's me. I'm so talented, I'm so smart, I'm so crafty, right, that I've built all of this, I've produced all of this, I've made all of this that I enjoy. And our ego will swell up, right, and we will become prideful in our hearts. And if you look at the picture that Moses is painting here, it looks a little different than what he spelled out when he was talking about vines and fig trees and pomegranates. There he was talking about the land and the land's provision. But what's he talking about here? Here's he's, he's talking about production and he's talking about multiplication. He's talking about surplus here, right? So he says, you're going to take what is in the land and then you're going to build houses and settle down and you're going to grow your flocks and you're going to grow your livestock and you're going to make it more and more abundant and you're going to invest in silver and in gold and it's going to multiply and you're going to profit. But there is a direct correlation from how much surplus you have and the danger of this trap of pride. That the more you have, the more you will feel tempted to fall into this and be prideful about what you've got. And we might look at that and say, well, yeah, but you still have to work hard to get those things, to build a house, to grow a flock, right, to invest my money well. I, it comes back to me because I did all that. But at the core of that, at the foundation of that, are the skills the talents, the strengths, the intellect, the work ethic that God gave you in the first place. And so that all still comes back to God's provision for you. He is the source of all of our blessings. And so the second trap, right, is if we forget that God is, gets, give, should get credit, we will give credit to ourselves, we become prideful, and when we do, here's what will happen. He says... Remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth and so confirms his covenant. And if you ever forget the Lord your God, you will follow other gods and worship and bow down to them. And I will testify against you today that you will surely be destroyed if you do. And so the last major pitfall of this journey is idolatry. That eventually, if we follow down that path, we will trade God for an idol. If we don't put, the God, put God at the center and give him gratitude and thanksgiving for everything that he has done for us, then we will eventually trade him for ourselves. And we'll worship ourselves and our pride and our ego. And we'll think we're at the center of everything. Or we'll worship the thing itself and wealth and stuff and the prosperity will become the center of our lives. And the consequence of that is that Israel and potentially us by extension will destroy our very relationship with God by violating the very first commandment. You will not have any other gods before me. Now, this is all, right, intended to help us. God wants to put us here so that we don't fall into these traps that cause us to drift from relationship and closeness and intimacy with him. He's saying, remember, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of slavery. I have rescued you, and here's how we live together. So just to recap, right, this is the pattern. This is, this is what I'll call the, the curse of prosperity. That prosperity leads to forgetfulness. When we forget to give God credit and, and be grateful to him, then we will be given over to pride, and pride will be followed by idolatry, and we will cease to worship God and worship ourselves. Now the thing is, as I read this, and I kind of read through these pages, I see a very familiar picture. Because what I see in this and who I see in this is Americans, right? Like, this is us. Now, America is, is not the new Israel. We are not the new Jerusalem. Right? Don't, don't, get, don't confuse that. But we do live, you and I, do live at the most prosperous time in the history of the world, as the most prosperous people group in the history of the world, in the most prosperous nation in the history of the world. 
when it, at least when it comes to material things, material wealth. And I know there are a lot of people in this room who are thinking right now, well, I'm not rich. And you might not feel rich, um, and you might be in a lean time right now, right? There are seasons, there are ups and downs to these things where we have more at sometimes and less at others. But think about this. The truth is, is that if you make $40,000 a year in America today, you are in the top 1% of wealth earners in the entire world on a $40,000 a year salary. If you live in your county, and let's go to the other end of our career, um, and we retire, and your home is worth the median worth in, in Pennsylvania, in York rather, which is about $280,000, and you have $87,000 in the bank, savings, 401k, that kind of thing, right? So a grand total of a net worth of around 350 grand, which is not poor by any means, but we're not, you know, living in Beverly Hills with that either. But if that describes you, you are in the top 10% richest people in the United States, not just in comparison to like, oh, I live in Ethiopia or Malawi or people that live on $2 a day, right? And compared to other Americans, you are in the top 10% if that is true about you. And so the truth is, is that most of us, myself included, live in a place of far more abundance and prosperity than most of us realize on a day-to-day -day basis. And yet, if you look at our culture, what we do is we follow this, this uh, pattern to a T, do we not? We have forgotten as a nation, as a people, and as individuals where our blessings come from. And in our pride, we look around and we say, I built this. This was all me. I did this myself. And then we have traded God for the idols of material wealth and possessions and things and our own pride. And the idols of success and status and accumulation and a big one, um, which is security, right? The security that accumulation brings. That's an idol for many of us. And so the irony is, right, we're just like Israel. Once again, like we talked about last week, this is, this is a reflection of us. And we follow that same pattern. And the, the great irony is, of course, that the more materially rich we've become, the more spiritually impoverished we've become as well. Now, the thing is, is there's good news about this as Christians, right? It's, it's a bleak picture when I paint it. I feel sad talking about it. But the truth is, is that there is hope in this. Because as people, as followers of Jesus, there is a different way to live. One that brings us back to gratitude and remembrance of what God has given and generosity as well. And the interesting thing is um, that, that as Jesus ministered through his ministry here on earth and talked about some of these things, one of his favorite places to come back to, to quote from, was the book of Deuteronomy. He quoted from Deuteronomy a lot. And one of the places we see it most significantly is in Jesus' temptation in the wilderness. Anybody know the story I'm talking about? So Jesus is baptized, and the Holy Spirit sends him out into the wilderness. And what's happening here is that Jesus is reliving and replaying the story of Israel. He gets sent to the wilderness, like Israel does. He's there for 40 days and 40 nights. They were there for 40 years, right? So there's some symbolism there. And just like they were tempted in the wilderness, so too Jesus is tempted by Satan. And as Satan comes to him, and he tempts him, and he says, um, throw yourself off the top of the tent temple, and I'll save you, I'll rescue you right, or demonstrate your power by doing this, Jesus comes back and he quotes Deuteronomy 6, and he says, no, nah, no, nah, that's okay. And then Satan says, look at all the kingdoms of the earth spread out before you. If you bow to me, I'll give you power over all of them. And Jesus says, no, thank you, and he quotes Deuteronomy 6. And then when Jesus is hungry, because he's been fasting for this whole time, Satan looks at him and he says, turn these stones into bread. Take your scarcity turn it into prosperity. And when he does, Jesus looks at Satan and he says, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. And that is a direct quote from Deuteronomy 8 and verse 3. And so Jesus succeeds where Israel fails. And Jesus succeeds where often most of us fail. Jesus refuses to trade his relationship with God for material abundance, trade his relationship with God for material possessions, because he can use his power to turn these stones into bread, and he says, no, 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 I'm not going to do that. I'm going to trust in the word of God instead. I'm going to trust in him over this temptation. And what's cool is that in these words um, is a strategy, 
in these words is, how, is, is the key in the picture of how you and I can fight back against this pattern and this temptation. Because what this quote says, um, that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God, is that true nourishment comes from the word and not from food. We know this about food, right? Food will always uh, leave us more hungry. So we can go to Olive Garden and we can eat all the bread we want, bottomless breadsticks. The next day, guess what? You're going to be hungry again, right? And so food will always leave us wanting more. And what Jesus says here is that there's something more important and more vital to us than food and bread and possessions and wealth and prosperity. It is the word of God. And he says, if we feast on that, then we can too can avoid these temptations. And so if you just look into the scriptures, and I'll just read a couple of them, right? Here's the, here's the kinds of things we hear. Uh, Hebrews chapter 13, keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you had have because God has said, Never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper, and I will not be afraid. James 1.17, um, we quoted that earlier. He says, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not change like the shifting sa- shadows. If we're reading words like that, that, how will we ever forget that God is the source of our blessings? Um, Philippians chapter 4 and verse 19, um, he says, or sorry, 4, yeah, 419. Uh, he says, my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. Jesus himself in John 14, uh, he says, the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you. Talk about not forgetting, right? The Holy Spirit will remind you of all the things I have said to you. And just speaking of one of the things that Jesus said to them, he said things like this, do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom of heaven. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out, a treasure in heaven that will never fail, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Those are the kinds of things the Holy Spirit will remind us of. And so the the picture that I'm painting here is that if we stay grounded in the word, if we stay rooted in the word, if we're constantly reading the scriptures, we will be reminded over and over and over again who the source of our blessings, uh, blessings is. And we will hear over and over and over again the word of God speaking to us, reminding us to be grateful, reminding us to remember the past, and reminding us to give gratitude and thanks to God. And so the thing is, is, is that this, you know, Edenic picture um, for Israel was tempting to them. It was where God ultimately wanted them. But there is a curse in it. But if we learn to be rooted in the word, and we learn to be reminded over and over and over again of these truths, of where our blessing comes from, the curse can turn into a cure. And the cure is to remember that man does not live on bread alone, He does not live on material possessions or prosperity or abundance, but instead man lives on every word that comes from the mouth of God. That is your true nourishment. Let's pray. Father, uh, we thank you for all the ways that you've been at work in our lives this week. And Lord, we pray um, that we would be able to come face to face with this reality and these traps and temptations that we often find ourselves falling into. That we are, Lord, a people who get tricked and trapped by um, possessions and by wealth, and they, we do turn them into idols, Lord. And it seems oftentimes like the material things before us are the most pressing needs. And yet, Lord, you tell us that our life does not consist in the things that we own and the possessions that we have, but instead is sustained and nourished by your word, which reminds us how to keep our blessings in perspective and reminds us to bring them back to you in praise. And so, Lord, my prayer for us today, every single one of us, is that we would not fall into the pattern that we see here in Deuteronomy, the pattern that Israel did eventually fall into. But instead, we put our faith and trust in Jesus as the one who succeeded where Israel failed and whose way of life leads us into a prosperous future in unity and closeness and relationship with you. And so, Lord, we thank you for your provision. We thank you for all that you have given us, most especially Jesus himself, who lived, died, and was raised to bring us into the final promised land. And so we pray all these things in his name, and now lift this prayer to you that he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done 
on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now as we uh, respond to God's word and the truth that he's revealed to us here today, uh, I'm going to invite you to stand because uh, we get to sing about trusting in God and trusting in his provision for us every single day. We'll do both and uh, let's sing. Word 
Amen. So this week, may you go in peace and live by faith, and may you not fall into the curse of prosperity, but instead remember the cure, which is to not trust in material wealth or possessions or even yourself, but to trust in Jesus and the word that he delivers to us. Have a great week.